Good morning. Today is the seventh Sunday after the festival of Pentecost. The Old Testament lesson and the gospel lesson have the common theme that uh, God's prophets are rejected sometimes even by his own people. That was the case for Ezekiel. It was also the case for Jesus in his own hometown of Nazareth. The good news is even though those prophets were rejected, they kept on preaching the word of God. The second lesson is our last lesson from 2 Corinthians. This morning it's from chapter 12. That will serve as our sermon text for this morning. Uh, we will begin this morning by singing hymn number 583. And if you're following along in the hymnal, it'll be sung to a different tune. It's sung to the tune of hymn number 223. This morning we will be following the service of the Word on page number 38 if you are using your hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Him. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. 
it stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Him. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson this morning is the Old Testament lesson. We read this morning from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. We read from chapter 2. He, the Lord, said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. The Spirit entered into me as he spoke to me and brought me up to my feet. Then I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to disloyal nations who have been disloyal to me. They and their fathers have rebelled against me to this very day. These children of mine are brazen-faced and hard-hearted. I am sending you to them, and you are to tell them that this is what the Lord God says. Then, whether they listen or do not listen, for they are a rebellious house, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. The word of the Lord. The psalm for this seventh Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm 143. You'll find it on page 118. We will sing the psalm in unison. The second lesson, the epistle lesson, is our reading from 2 Corinthians. We read from chapter 12. These are Paul's words. 
to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. We'll now sing together the verse of the day. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this seventh Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter 6. We'll begin reading at verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did this man learn these things? What is this wisdom that has been given to this man? How is it that miracles such as these are performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joses, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own house. He could not do any miracles there, except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went around the villages teaching. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. We'll continue with him 428.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of our good and gracious Lord Jesus, dear friends, the first parish I served after graduating from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and being assigned was full of avid hunters. One fall day, one of those hunters walked into a hunting blind, sat down on a blanket, and unbeknownst to him, sat on a bunch of porcupine quills that had been hidden under the blanket. He was able to remove all of those porcupine quills from his backside, except for one. That one porcupine quill buried itself in his backside. And it caused him pain every day. It affected his work, it affected his recreation, and everything he did. In the spring, that one remaining quill finally festered. And it caused him so much pain that he had to have it surgically removed. True story. That one remaining festering quill was not something that that hunter was going to rejoice in. Paul had a similar experience. He had a thorn in his flesh, and it caused him much pain. And he desperately pleaded to the Lord for its removal. But the Lord would not remove the thorn. Instead, he gave Paul the means to endure that thorn. We have all had the experience of Paul. We all have a thorn that plagues our lives and which we would rejoice to have removed. But sometimes the Lord denies our request as he denied Paul's. And instead of removing our thorn, he just gives us the means to endure it. And in the end, like Paul, we can rejoice in our thorns. We want our thorns removed, but the Lord helps us deal with them instead. Paul begins to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. This past spring I had some of the largest pricker bushes in my backyard that I have ever seen. They were this high. You know the kind I'm talking about. They're green. They're a weed. They have lots of thorns on them, and when you touch them or brush up against them, it hurts. Paul writes that he had a thorn in his flesh, but it was not a real thorn like you would see on a weed or a plant. Paul was speaking figuratively. He had some kind of affliction that was acting like a thorn to him. It was causing him much pain and difficulty. Paul describes his thorn as a messenger of Satan. God, not Satan, had brought this thorn to Paul, but Satan was God's unwitting tool in bringing that thorn to Paul. Paul describes the purpose for which the thorn was sent to him. It was sent to torment him. That Greek verb there means to pummel with the fists. And the tense of that Greek verb meant that it was a continual tormenting. Paul's thorn was some sort of affliction that caused Paul continual sharp and nagging pain in his life. But Paul never tells us what the thorn was. There are some guesses, however. It was most likely a physical ailment. Some surmise that it was a physical condition like malaria. Others would guess that it was some sort of eye problem. Some guess that it was a severe speech impediment. We'll never know for sure what Paul's thorn was. But we can be certain that Paul's thorn caused him much pain and difficulty in his life. 
Last week, I was working on a project in my garage. And after I was all finished with it, I went to wipe off some of the debris from my wooden workbench. And when I did, I got a sliver. And boy, did that little piece of wood hurt under my skin. Almost immediately, I went into the house, grabbed the tweezers, and pulled that sliver out. That's what most of us would do, right? It's natural for us to want to remove what's causing us pain. Naturally, Paul wanted his thorn removed. Because he thought his life would be better off without it and his ministry more successful. And so Paul pleaded, prayed in that vein. He pleaded earnestly with the Lord and prayed to him three times to have his thorn removed. We all have had the experience Paul had. Because we all have thorns, something that causes us continual sharp and nagging pain in our life. Something that makes our life Difficult, makes our job difficult. Maybe your thorn is something physical. Maybe it's diabetes or high blood pressure or bad eyesight or a weak heart or difficulty hearing or chronic debilitating pain. Maybe your thorn is something psychological like depression or feelings of extreme anger or chronic and debilitating anxiety, or nervousness. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's unresolved feelings or issues. Naturally, we want those thorns removed because we figure our life would be better without it and our job less difficult. And so like Paul, we have prayed. Or maybe we are right now praying for that thorn to be removed. All Christians have a thorn. And they would like that thorn removed, but sometimes the Lord doesn't grant that request. And instead of removing the thorn, he helps us deal with the thorns. Paul continues, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul prayed to the Lord for the removal of his thorn. And you can be certain that the Lord heard Paul's prayer because he hears all the prayers of all of his children. And the Lord answered Paul's prayer. He just answered it in a different way than Paul requested the Lord's answer to Paul's prayer was, My grace is sufficient for you. Paul's thorn would not be removed. Instead, the Lord would give Paul his grace to sustain him through his thorn. Knowing that the Lord loved him and knowing that the Lord had a loving purpose for the thorn would assist Paul. It would help him in enduring the pain of his thorn. The Lord had a loving purpose, and Paul reveals that loving purpose for his thorn. He writes that he had been given this thorn to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. In the original Greek, that phrase, to keep me from becoming conceited, is repeated twice. Paul could have become conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations he had been granted by the Lord. What were those revelations? Paul wrote about one just previous to our text. He speaks about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And I know that this man was caught up to paradise. He saw heaven. It could have been very easy for Paul to become conceited to get a big head and to be arrogant and puffed up because of what the Lord had given him the privilege of seeing. So the Lord gave Paul his thorn as a vaccine to prevent such pride. Paul reveals another of the Lord's loving purposes when he writes, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul viewed his thorn as a constant reminder that he was weak and mortal. 
which kept him despairing of himself and which drove him to Christ for his strength, where he is exactly where he needed to be. By the end of our text, we observe a sea change in Paul's attitude toward his thorn. He says, For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Paul was no longer lamenting about his thorn. He no longer considered it a hindrance. He gladly accepted it. He did not desire its removal any longer. In fact, he would now boast and rejoice in his thorn and any other kind of pain or suffering that entered into his life because he saw the Lord's good purpose for his thorn and he knew he had the Lord's grace to endure it. Like Paul, we can view our thorn positively. Whatever it is, we can rejoice in it and we can boast in it. Why? Why? Because our thorn serves a good purpose. It serves the Lord's loving purpose. It keeps us despairing of ourselves and drives us back to Christ exactly where we need to be. At the same time, it rids us of our sinful pride and our arrogance and keeps us humble and mindful of our dependence on Christ But do we always rejoice and boast about our thorn? Do you always see the Lord's good purpose in our thorn and patiently endure it? It's just the opposite, isn't it? We complain about our thorn. We get angry about our thorn. We shake an angry fist at the Lord when he says, I'm not going to remove your thorn. We're dreadful sinners, aren't we? We deserve nothing less than God's eternal punishment. But Jesus Christ rescued us, didn't didn't he? He patiently endured every affliction while he lived on this earth, and there were many. Many endured every affliction God demanded as a payment for our sin, including death and hell itself. And he did it all for you and for me to spare us from God's just punishment for our sins. Isaiah wrote, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, through Christ, we are at peace with God. And now we can be certain that any thorn that we have, anything that causes pain and suffering in our life, serves the Lord's good purpose. Do you have a thorn? that is causing pain and difficulty in your life right now? You can endure it. You can boast in it. You can even rejoice in it. You can do all those things because of Christ and because of His grace which gives you the strength. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now confess our Christian faith. We will use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. We will continue with the prayer that begins on page number six. You will also find this prayer on page 127 if you are following along in the hymnal. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring, our, we bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Hear us, Lord, as we now bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with him 420. Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death, through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. close this morning by singing the fifth verse of hymn number 90. Good morning again to all of you. If you would like to be a greeter, there is a sign-up sheet underneath the flower calendar. Uh, Women of Faith will have their monthly meeting next Tuesday. That's the 20th of July. The uh, Mother-Daughter Banquet is on the 24th. There's more information about that on the insert in your bulletin. And also Bonnie Moore can help you with 
uh, registration and cost. Sunday the 15th of August is our anniversary service, uh, 50 years of our church building. We'll worship outdoors for that, followed by a meal. The more information will be forthcoming. We will be having Bible school in August from the 9th until the 13th. Now, there's an insert, I believe, again, and there's also much information on the back on the round table. Um, Laura is always willing to ask or answer your questions. We need teachers, and don't let that scare you. Teaching is not difficult. Laura prints out all the materials for teachers. It practically tells you what to do, so it's not difficult. If you can find it in your heart to teach, we would appreciate that. And there's many other things you can do. Um, Sunday school is in person this fall. Thankfully, we have two teachers, and I appreciate your effort. Um, other than that, I have nothing else. Anybody? Nobody told me anything before church that I forgot. So, all right, thank you very much. God bless the rest of your day.